So we're going to talk now a little bit about coronary anomalies. We just learned about what the normal anatomy looks like, so now we're going to talk about anomalies. I have no financial disclosure. Here are just two basic objectives. You know, what are the categories? How are you going to categorize the coronary anomalies? And then what are the hemodynamically significant ones? And hopefully when I'm done, I will have actually taught you something and you learned it rather than just teaching at you. So when we break the coronary anomalies down, basically we can put them in three categories, whether they have an anomalous origin, whether they have anomalous course, or anomalous termination. And as I'm sure many of you know who have seen these, oftentimes it's a combination. They don't often, if they have an anomalous origin, they also have an anomalous course. So anomalies of origin, um, ones that arise from the tubular portion of the aorta, again, not a hemodynamically significant one, as we'll see later, but can be considered an anomaly. Multiple ostea, as we already saw, one without a left main, so that the LAD and the circumflex arise directly from the aorta. Ones that have just a single osteum, so both the right and the left coronary arterial system both arise from one osteum from the aorta. Ones that connect to the pulmonary artery, and then also ones that come off the wrong sinus. So do the, is the left system coming off the right or the right system coming off the left? And those actually occur at about equal uh, occurrence. Again, here's another case of just an absent left main. If you considered a coronary anomaly, which as, as you've heard, some people don't, and you know, it can be a normal variant for sure, um, it's, it would be considered the most common. So let's look at one here that has a single osteum. So this was a patient that we were evaluating prior to uh, an aortic surgery. They were actually having a thoracic abdominal aneurysm being repaired. And so we were evaluating the patient ahead of time and they wanted to look at the coronary arteries. And you can see that we have just a single osteum as you scroll up and down. This is the only connection to the aorta for the art uh, coronary artery system. The right coronary artery is going to go this way as you'll see, to live in the right atrioventricular groove, as we just learned. And the left coronary artery system is going to go this way. And as you see, it's actually going to traverse within the myocardium of the interventricular septum. So this is actually a transeptal course with just a single osteum. You'll see as it comes over here, it gives the LAD going down this way. And actually, there's flow retrograde in the LAD to supply the left circumflex. So you'll see the left circumflex comes up and is supplied in a retrograde fashion. Here's a nice case lent to me by Pratchy Agarwal from Michigan. You'll see that there's lots and lots of collaterals in the mediastinum. A lot of these collaterals are actually bronchial arteries, but some of these are actually coronary arteries. And this is a much more rare case. You can see here, coronary artery, which is connecting to the pulmonary artery. It's the right coronary artery because as we scroll here, we can see the left coronary artery here. And so the left coronary artery is connecting here. The blood is flowing through the left coronary artery around and then flowing retrograde through the right coronary artery to the pulmonary artery. So you have a coronary steel and that's why you have all these large dilated vessels. This was actually discovered incidentally in this patient who was in their 80s. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen this drawing before. This basically just illustrates the four uh, courses that we commonly talk about when there is an anomalous origin. Intraarterial, going between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Retroaortic, going behind the aorta. Going in front of the pulmonary artery, the prepulmonic, and then the transeptal. And it was very interesting because over the years, I've seen more and more transeptal courses. Where, you know, I would say probably a third to half of almost all the coronary anomalies I see now are this transeptal course. There is a fifth, which I've read about, a retrocardiac, where the course goes all the way posterior to the atrium. But I myself have never seen one. So if you've ever seen one or have one, please let me know. Um, here's a uh, RCA that's going interarterial. You can see that the right coronary artery here is arising from the left coronary cusp. The left coronary artery is arising from its normal location. It's between the aorta here and the pulmonary artery. It then courses to live within the left, or excuse me, the right atrioventricular groove. Here's another patient. This was a younger patient, a patient with Marfan's. You can see that there's a dilated aorta. So again, another pre-surgical uh, evaluation. So we were looking at the coronary arteries. 
you can see that there's a coronary artery arising here from the very proximal RCA and is actually traversing posterior at the level of the aortic valve around the back of the aorta to go over and supply into the left atrioventricular groove. So this is a left circumflex. And as you can imagine, this is very important in this patient who's going to be having aortic surgery to make sure that they don't injure the left circumflex coronary artery at the time of surgery. Um, transeptal, here's another transeptal course. Again, I want to illustrate that I think these are a lot more common than we originally thought. There's not a lot of literature out there about them. They think that overall, because um, the, they're going through the myocardium, that they're probably not malignant, although they are technically a myocardial bridge. Again, single ostium, right coronary artery going here, and the left, the entire left coronary system traversing in the myocardium within the interventricular septum, supplying the LAD, and then also, if you look carefully, there's basically retrograde flow through the LAD to come up and supply the left circumflex. Here's a congenital heart. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the, the overall uh, anomalies within the heart. You can see there are several. I just want to point out that this is one of the situations where you shouldn't be surprised to see anomalous coronary arteries, in particular from the non-coronary cusp. So this is one of, the, one of the times you may see the non-coronary cusp actually supply a coronary artery. In this case, the circumflex is arising from that non-coronary cusp. And in addition, both the right and the LAD are coming off the left um, cusp, and the right coronary artery is then traversing over. In this case, it's a little bit of a uh, not really truly an interarterial course because there's essentially no pulmonary artery there because it has pulmonary artery atresia. So there's really not the same hemodynamics between the aorta and the pulmonary artery in this situation. Uh, where there's pulmonary artery atresia. Here's just another combination. This is a, a patient who has both an anomalous right coronary artery with an intraarterial course. You can see it's coming off the left uh, cusp, going between the aorta and the pulmonary artery to supply the, uh, in the right atrioventricular groove. You can see the right coronary artery is somewhat dilated and also somewhat tortuous. And as we scroll up, we can also see that the left coronary system actually connects here to the pulmonary artery. So we actually have a interarterial course with a coronary steel with blood flow to the pulmonary artery. Then you can have anomalies of just course. Uh, we can have myocardial bridging, and as we saw earlier, a duplicate LAD. So here's just myocardial bridging. We see this fairly commonly. It occurs in about a third of patients when you look at the images on CT, and, about, and the majority of these are within the mid-LAD. Generally, they don't cause much problem, although rarely they can cause uh, ischemia and sudden death. Uh, termination, we can have fistulas. We can have arcades. Arcades are basically sort of like collaterals, except they tend not to be as tortuous. They tend to be more direct, straight-line vessel connections and we can have extra cardiac terminations. Here's a nice case of an RCA to coronary sinus fistula. We can see that the right coronary artery is very large. It's also very tortuous as we follow it down. And then as we come down to the coronary sinus, we can see that there's bright contrast in the coronary sinus. But if we scroll up, we look at the great cardiac vein, we can see that the great cardiac vein isn't very well opacified. So that tells us that something is filling the coronary sinus early. And it's actually a very complex network here, but there are more than one connection here between the distal RCA and the coronary sinus. Here's a coronary cameral fistula, so a fistula from the coronary sinus to a heart chamber. You can see that the origin of the left coronary, in particular, the left circumflex is very, very large. It's actually very tortuous and dilated. It's coming back here behind the aorta and kind of superior to the left atrium and actually makes a connection here to the right atrium. And here's just a 3D volume of that nice big dilated vessel. Okay, so now let's make sure we know which ones are clinically significant because you're going to see coronary anomalies. Most of them are going to be managed medically, but there are some that need to be aggressive, more aggressively managed. 
So they occur in about 1% of patients, about 20% of them are actually hemodynamically significant. And as you can imagine, they can cause ischemia. And the most important thing that we're worried about, obviously, is sudden death. In fact, in about a third of non-traumatic sudden deaths in young patients, it's due to coronary anomalies. And as we've seen, cardiac CT is basically the gold standard. I mean, this is the one time where cardiac CT has no competition. In fact, there, were, there have been multiple studies, but about 50% of the coronary anomalies are correctly identified with cath compared to CT. So the hemodynamically significant ones, anytime you have a coronary artery that connects to the pulmonary artery, that's going to create a steel phenomena, so those are hemodynamically significant. The ones that go intraarterial, I would tell you that generally that's basically just the ones that are the left side that goes intraarterial. Most of the time, the ones that are right coronary arteries that I've, that I've shown you that go intraarterial are being managed more conservatively. The coronary artery fistulas, and as I mentioned earlier, rarely or occasionally myocardial bridges can cause issues. So when they connect to the pulmonary artery, they can present with congestive heart failure or ischemia. In particular, when the left coronary artery arises from the pulmonary artery, those are the ones that are generally discovered very early in life, usually within the first four months. However, about 25% of those patients actually do survive to adulthood. And as you can imagine, the more collaterals there are, the more likely they are to go unnoticed. The one case I showed you where the right coronary artery arises from the pulmonary artery in general is felt to be much less severe. So those patients very typically will live to adulthood. And oftentimes, as you've seen in that case, where there's so many collaterals, if you actually tried to repair that, you would actually do more harm to the patient. So it's not uncommon that we'll find these ones with right coronary arteries from the pulmonary artery actually living into adulthood. And then, as I mentioned, more collaterals uh, are protective. So when the left coronary artery goes into our arterial, those are the ones we really worry about. There's a high risk of sudden death, especially in young athletes. And you can think about during exercise. Whenever you exercise, you're going to increase your blood flow through both the pulmonary artery and the aorta, which is going to tend to compress that coronary vessel. In addition, if you think about it, coronary blood flow is during diastole. And during a cardiac cycle, systole actually, regardless of your heart rate, stays relatively stable. So diastole is the time period that changes. So as you exercise and increase your heart rate, your time of diastole decreases. So you've got this compression effect as well as a decreased time of perfusion. In addition, the vessel comes off at a very acute angle, which can obstruct flow. And there's some argument that there's a slightly longer course within the wall of the aorta, which can also restrict the flow at the origin. Fistulas, about half of the patients are symptomatic, and you can see here the various reasons for symptoms. About half of them arise from the right coronary artery, and about two-thirds of them actually connect to the right heart, so either the right ventricle or the right atrium, and greater than 90% of them will actually have a left-to-right shunting of blood. So we've talked about the, cor the coronary anomaly categories, and as I mentioned, oftentimes it's a combination of these and then the hemodynamically significant ones. Anytime they connect to the pulmonary artery, the left coronary system in particular going interarterial, fistulas, and then rarely or occasionally myocardial bridges.